Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew within me a right spirit. I'm Pastor Rob Myallis, and welcome today to worship. This is the fifth Sunday in Lent, and we continue on our Lenten journey this year to wholeness. Whether you're calling in or in the parking lot or watching on YouTube live or later this week, or whether you're gathered in the sanctuary this morning, we trust that the Spirit is gathering us in, that we may together praise God and hear the word. I invite you now to take a breath and enter into worship. Please rise as you are able. We worship in the name in which we baptize, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin Receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us pause for reflection as we together confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another.
most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. For it is by grace that you have been saved. Out of great love, God sent Jesus Christ, the beloved, to die for your sins. And as he lives victorious from the grave, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Our opening hymn is 434. And if you're in the sanctuary, I invite you to hum along. And if you're at home, you can sing as loudly as you'd like. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. love, you draw us into yourself. In mercy, you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, 
that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is taken from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and then left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. The word of the Lord. We will speak Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12, responsibly. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and right in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have no, no wisdom deep within. Remove my sins with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. We are turning, Lord, to hear you. You are merciful and kind. Slow to anger, rich in blessing, and with love to us inclined. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. The leaders themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out ahead of them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to him, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? 
Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to pray with me. O Lord, create in us clean hearts. Open us to the truth, the truth of your Son and his death and resurrection for us. Amen. Okay, I invite you to be seated. Would you like to come? Can you help me again? Okay. Well, this, this Lent we are on a journey to wholeness. And this week we're going to put another piece. This one's a little bit tougher. Not tough for you. You've done puzzles. Okay, so here we go. Again, we're... And uh, this week, the word is societal. Okay. Sam, could you actually turn down my mic or just a little bit? Okay, yeah, that's good. What is truth? This is the haunting and cynical question of Pilate 2,000 years ago. And I don't know if we have a much better answer. What is truth? This last week there was murder in Atlanta. Do we know what happened? Do we know why what happened happened? What is the truth in, in those events? What is the real story? What is the truth about violence against Asian Americans in our country? What is truth? What about these masks and these vaccines? Do they work? Do they work for me? Do they work for you? What is truth? What about the election? What about January 6th? What really happened? Who really stirred up what? What happened in these, these states like Pennsylvania? What is truth anyway? What is the truth about climate change? Really, is the Earth's temperature really rising out of control? Can't scientists fix it? What is the truth? You get your YouTube videos, I'll give you mine. You can give me your websites you look at. I can show you mine, and we can hash it out in the comments section in Facebook or Reddit. But we seem no, no closer to the, to the truth. Information is cheap nowadays, and spin is, oh, out of control and everywhere. But the truth seems harder to find than, than ever and we live in these sort of information bubbles where we reinforce our own truths. And, and we become so much like Babel where even uh, though we all speak English, it's as if we don't have the same language. That famous quote once by a senator, you're entitled to your own opinions but not your own facts. That doesn't seem true anymore. And again, we all have our own truths, our, our own facts that we're operating out of. And we are just so divided along all of these demographics, urban, rural, rich, poor, black, white, oh, you name it. And again, there's a division, a barrier in our society, and it seems as if a common language, a common truth uh, is, is nowhere to be found. We've, we've lost that filter on the fringe. What is truth? Do we really have a better answer than 2,000 years ago? It's worth reflecting on, on how we got here, how we got to a modern-day Babel where we just can't sort of seem to get along and it just all sort of seems like noise after a while and the truth just flies out the window. Part of it is that as, as humans, this has always been true, we don't especially like to be told that we're wrong. And this is just, most of us don't wake up in the morning and say, man, I'm really looking for constructive feedback today. Right? No, we, we tend to, to really uh, not want to be criticized, and we don't like truth that would tell us that we're not doing something right. 
We don't like truth that would be uncomfortable, and we don't like truth that would force us to change how we're living, and we, we avoid that. We avoid that. Especially the last year. See, the, the last year, we've, we've all been under sort of this extenuated time of anxiety and stress. And it turns out that when we're under stress as humans over a long period of time, we have little to no desire to reach out and talk to people who are different. It's like when you're sick, you want comfort food. And when you're anxious, you want comfort people. You want people who are going to get along with you, who are going to affirm, even in the best possible light, your own prejudices. Again, this is how it works for us as humans under, under stress. And we've all been under stress. And so we much would rather hear people who think like us, talk like us, vote like us, than otherwise. But Pilate points us, I think, towards an even uh, a more haunting answer. For, you see, for Pilate, Pilate does have an answer to his question of what is truth. Uh, for Pilate, the answer is power. Power is truth. And the whole, the whole thing is laced with power. You see, first the Jewish leaders come to Pilate. But they want to snub Pilate, so they won't go inside the governor's palace. They don't want to be ritually unclean for the Passover. But Pilate, he's a Roman governor, and he knows how to play these power games. So he comes out. He says, well, why don't you guys try him under your own law? He knows very well they can't do this. They want to put Jesus to death. And as Jews, they don't have that power. They're an occupied territory. Only Rome can serve capital punishment. He's sticking it to him. He's saying, we've got the power. You don't. But in the end, you see, it keeps going around. Pilate determines the truth is that Jesus is innocent of anything deserving death. But this doesn't matter because the crowds get riled up. And the crowd suddenly have the power. And Pilate is concerned about his own political future. He knows he's got to keep this riot from turning into an insurrection. And so he lets Jesus be flogged, beaten, crucified, killed. For Pilate, he knows what is truth. It's power. The ones in power get to control what the truth is. This is still so true today. Dwight Eisenhower talked about a military-industrial complex, and I'd like to suggest today that we, we suffer from something different, and what we'll call it is we'll call it the political media complex. This, this uh, alliance of, of various companies and industries that, that they thrive. They thrive off of our anger. Their goal is to keep us engaged and enraged. The more engaged and enraged we are, the more it goes to ching, to ching, to ching for them. And they have so much power to control truth. So, for instance, you know, you go to Google, and you just want to get information, right? So you type in. And if you'll notice, Google will often finish the sentence for you, right? So if you type in, um, you know, something, it'll finish it. And if actually, what's happening is that the computer is remembering your other searches, what other articles you've gone to, what other websites you like. And the computer's... Their back computers in a basement in California or somewhere, they're churning through this, and they're figuring out what you like, and they want you to keep clicking, because that means more money from advertisers for them. And so when you type in climate change is, depending on what else you have searched for on the internet, it will either complete the sentence for you, is a hoax, or is real. It doesn't care about the truth. It cares about you clicking and giving them money. And if you're even on social media, now the power is even turned up. What they're actually doing, when you look at your screen, the computers are recording how long you're looking at your screen. Not just what you like, how many seconds you looked at an image. And they're going to use that data then to figure out who you are, what you like, and how they can keep you enraged and engaged. Cha-ching, cha-ching all the way to the bank. And so here we are in our own little information ecosystems, thinking that the world is full of crazy other people, divided like Babel, and there's a bunch of people just walking to the bank. This is where we are right now. This is where we are. And so how do we go forward? How do we go forward? Well, I want to turn... I want to turn as we reflect then this Lenten journey on healing and, and what it might be for Jesus Christ to bring us healing in our society, to help us overcome some of these divisions that we have. 
I want us to turn to Jesus' words here. And Jesus says that he has come to testify to the truth. Jesus says that he has come to give his witness of what the truth is. So what is this truth that Jesus proclaims? Well, what happens right after this, Pilate says, what is truth? And then it's going to be answered. Jesus is flogged. That means whipped. Jesus is beaten. And then they put a crown of thorns on Jesus' head. They dress him in purple, the color of royalty, and they hail him as king of the Jews. So here we have this person who's beaten up, bloodied, mocked, scorned, betrayed. And then Pilate says, Behold the man. Behold the man. And it's not just a statement about who Jesus is. It's a statement about what it means to be human. What does it mean to be human? But it means that we are wounded. We are beaten up by other people because we are inescapably cruel to one another. Behold the man. It's not just Jesus, but it's everybody else who's, who's perpetrating and participating in this vast system of injustice. We too are those who wound we too are those who hurt others. Behold the man. What is the truth about us as humans that we are both wounded and we are wounding others and ourselves? This is the painful truth that the cross bears witness to about who we are as humans. But Jesus, Jesus has a power even there. For in, in this truth, in this truth that, that we are both wounded and wounding others, this is always the soil for reconciliation. And that the moments of reconciliation that we have in our lives almost certainly run their way through the cross, through a time of recognizing and acknowledging our own wounds as well as the times we have wounded other people. For you see, Jesus points to another truth, and he says that his kingdom is not of this world. You see, for, for Jesus, power and wounds are different. The power in the kingdom of this world is the ability to spin truth. The power of the kingdoms of this world is to wound the weak and keep them down. But in the kingdom of God, power is something different. In the kingdom of God... Kingdom of God flows from the truth of the cross that God has given everything he has for this world that he loves. In the cross, the power is that even the wounds that we have done to each other, even the wounds that we have can become spots, can become places of healing, of reconciliation between peoples. So I, I just want to share one story here, one example of, of God's work in this world to bring together people who were once divided. Because I think it's so easy for us to lose sight that this is even possible anymore. But it is, and this is the will of God. This is the power of God, the truth of God, working its way out in this world. So if I looked at the world between 1750 and 1950, I would look at the globe and I would see these two countries, Germany and France, and I would notice that about every 20 to 40 years, they would go to war with each other. Right? French troops go in. They all die in the battlefield. 25 years later, German troops go in. They die in the battlefield. Right? This is, just, this is the pattern. For two centuries, these nations just keep fighting each other. And when they're not at war, their guns are right pointed towards each other. Well, after World War II, there was this realization that they just, they just couldn't punish Germany enough. They had to do something else. There had to be another way forward. And so especially the leaders of France and Germany said, we've got to figure this out. And so they, they learned to speak each other's language. And 75 years later, there, there's been no war between those two countries. In fact, the thought today that, that Germany and France could go to war seems preposterous. Yet again, for 200 years, all they did was fight each other. And, and what I, I've learned over time is that that wasn't just sort of trade agreements at the top. But that was also the willingness of people in both of those countries to begin to build a bridge. 
And it's, it's amazing how many youth from both countries in the generation after World War II would go and spend time and summers and semesters in each other's houses. So again, they could learn to live together and bless the continent with peace. Now, my own family was actually a beneficiary of this exchange movement. Both my mom and my dad in, in high school, uh, their families actually received exchange students from Germany. And, you know, it doesn't sound that big of a deal today, but, right, my parents were still growing up in the aftermath of World War II where we had had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people die in German, shore, in German battlefields. Anyway, so, so there they were, and they had this exchange, and it ended up that my mom would fall in love with German culture, become a German professor, and then actually 40 years later, both my mom and my dad would end up working in Germany together. Something sort of un, uh, could not have been conceived of between 1900 and 1950. I, I offer this again as a story, a small story of, of hope that we can feel like the divisions in our society are just so intractable. They, they can't be resolved. The, the hatred and the prejudices and the, and the fake news, it's just all so much. We can't, we can't ever do this. But again, there's another kingdom, another kingdom which is coming from God that, that breaks into our world and, and finds a way, finds a way for us to, to overcome these. And so often it happens just one friendship, one conversation, one prejudice overturned at a time. So what do we do? Well, I suppose I could put together some, some laundry list of, of noble, virtuous things including how we use social media, how we engage other people. But I'll just leave it today with, with just the proclamation of the truth. The truth is that we are wounded, and we wound other people, and we desperately need a Savior. And that salvation has come in Jesus Christ. And the truth is that He has died, and He is risen for you. And it is by his wounds that we are healed so that in and through you, God's healing may work its way into this world and into the next. Amen. sent your son to die for all that our lost world might hear your call oh hear us lest we stray and fall we rest our hope in Let us together confess our faith you
as we journey towards the cross. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. Dearest Jesus, this Lent, we pray that we might seek your truth boldly and courageously for the wholeness of all people. Let us bear witness to the light that is your Son, Jesus Christ, God of the cross. Hear our prayer. Dearest Jesus, we pray for those who mourn this week. We especially pray for those who were murdered in Atlanta. We uplift those who are persecuted for the color of their skin, their ethnicity, or even the way they speak. May we always find ways to support and show love to all of God's creation. God of the cross, hear our prayer. Dearest Jesus, we pray for the church as your body in the world. Let us make a joyful noise in the proclaiming of your gospel today and every day. We pray for the ministries here at St. Paul. We pray for the resurrection band, community composting, and the teaching of your children. God of the cross, hear our prayer. Dearest Jesus, we pray for those in need of your healing, especially the names on our prayer list and those we say now to you aloud or in the silence of our hearts. God of the cross, hear our prayer. These things and whatever else you know we need, we pray for, it, we pray for in your holy name. Amen. Next week is Holy Week, and so I just want to go over with you how that's going to look this year. Uh, next week at the 815, the service will look very familiar, and we will uh, try once again to have a procession that starts outside and, and comes in. At 1045 next week, we will have a service um, really meant for, for cars um, in the parking lot. If the, if the weather is nice, We'll certainly get out and process for all glory, loud, and honor at that service. And if it hopefully, again, is a nice spring day, then people can just uh, sit outside next week at 1045. On Maundy Thursday, we will have uh, a worship service at 11 a.m. with communion. And in the evening, there's actually uh, will be uh, a packet for some home faith worship. If you think about the first Maundy Thursday, the Last Supper, this was a worship service done in the homes. So it seems like a natural time for us to try something uh, this year in the homes. Good Friday, there is a community service, but the service at St. Paul will be at 7 o'clock in the evening, and that will also be available on live stream. On Easter Sunday, we will have worship at 815 in, in the sanctuary, and then at 1045, we will be outside and the weather is going to be beautiful and I don't want to hear anything plan B, C, D, E, F, or G. It's just, it's just going to be nice weather. That's it. Um, my, again, today we're, we sort of have reconfigured the seating to uh, allow for more people inside and again, I thank you for your continued cooperation. Um, these next few months are going to be the trickiest as sort of we sort of fall out of sort of this winter and COVID at, at different speeds. And so I thank you for your cooperation and your patience. Um, my hope is that starting after Easter, we will not have to have signups for worship anymore. That'll, I think, be the next sort of thing to change. But again, I thank you for your, your cooperation. In terms of faith formation and Sunday school, on the uh, Easter Sunday, April the 4th, we will uh, actually that week again resume in-person Sunday school. And I think one class will be in the social hall um, and other classes will be outside. And uh, that Sunday I'm offering a catch-all Sunday school on evidence of the resurrection, rational proof, so to speak, for the most irrational of Christianity's claims. Um, and then in terms of sort of the way we're doing outreach, uh, two things. Again, today I think is a big day for the Lutheran World Relief Kits. I thank everybody who's participated. I know we had a number of fifth and sixth graders yesterday uh, making them. So again, thank you for all who participated in that. 
And then uh, this Tuesday, there'll actually be the, we'll go online a video um, that the children made for this week of this week's lessons. And included in that is actually a video from Congo Lutheran that we just got this week. So uh, thank you above all for your faithfulness in your, in your contributions that are allowing us to continue in mission and in ministry. And with that, I invite us all to rise as our gifts are presented. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. What is truth? Turns out 2,000 years later we don't have much of a better answer than the one that was standing right before Pilate, and that is Jesus the Christ, who although, yes, we are wounded through his wounds, healing comes to us and to this world. So as you go forth this week, may the peace that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Amen. of Christ be with you always and also with you and at this time I invite you to share a word of peace using the American sign language peace be with you
Go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will make all things new. And so with the choirs of angels and the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their honor. And in him, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we do this, we proclaim the great mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And in that great hope, we pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin. Grant us peace. I thank all those who have called in or have uh, been watching on the YouTube. This ends the broadcast portion of our worship service. If you would like communion, you can come to the church uh, after either service or we can arrange a Eucharistic